Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted, and I mean truly delighted, to welcome back friend and supporter of Access Chat, Paul Smythe, who's Head of Accessibility at, at Barclays Access. Paul, it's great to see you again. Actually, you've got several other hats that you're also wearing. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of which, of course, is um, co-chair of the, the Business Disability Forums Technology Task Force, but you're also the, uh, the Disability Sector Champion for Web Accessibility for the UK Government. And this is particularly pertinent because mm -hmm. this Monday, uh, new legislation came into effect around public sector web accessibility. So uh, what what how can we put this in layman's terms about uh, what it is and you know of course give us a bit of a heads up about you know what you're doing you know and how you came to be in this role sure great well well thanks Neil and hi N nice to be back with uh, the fantastic trio of it is access chat I I was thinking about this and this is my third time back and I'm sort of wowed of how the access chat community has kind of grown strength to strength so first off you know big thanks for you folks and the consistency and continuity to keep running this, for the awesome speakers you get when I look back and, and sort of listen in on them, some of the sessions you've had in recent weeks, and just for the, um, the kind of encouragement and the conversations that happen. Um, you, you're right, Neil, you know, this week marks a bit of a, you know, major milestone for, for the UK and Europe. We've got this new uh, accessibility regulations landing. And I kind of wanted to make sure that everyone's got, you know, a clear understanding of what it is and what it means. And I guess for me, you know, this has work, been worked on the last four years or so. What's changed this week is it means any newly built public sector website needs to be accessible. In another year or so, it means all public sector websites need to be accessible. And in two years from now, it means all public sector um, mobile apps need to be accessible. So breaking this down, this is, you know, your local government or council website. It's about university and colleges and so forth. It's about publicly funded charities. So it's great to see this added requirement coming in saying, you know, thou shalt build accessible digital services. And I think just to sort of up break it down, what, what it means is if you're a, um, if you work in a public sector organization, your websites are actually intranets and colleague systems. Um, you know, you need to sort of one, do an accessibility check of them. Two, you need to be able to understand what things are broken and explain that in a clear, practical, plain English way. And you need to kind of package that as an accessibility standard on your website, saying kind of, here's what we've checked, whether we're partially or thoughtfully, you know, compliant. Um, and importantly, how to contact us if you've got feedback and suggestions. So it's a great opportunity to actually engage the community of users with access needs. So, you know, incredible that it's landed now in UK and Europe. Um, I know with my hat on um, working as a sector champion for UK government, I'm really pleased to see too that, again, it's being monitored in terms of compliance. So in the UK, it's our government digital services, or GDS friends, who will be over the coming weeks um, monitoring you know thousands of sites and figuring out you know who's um who's got a statement who's accessible clearly there will be a transition because we know that many 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 um public sector websites aren't there yet but you know it's fantastic to see that there's a bit more legislation with teeth coming in and it's making it easier for people to give feedback too so yeah. really exciting i i mean so there are a couple of points that i think are really interesting so firstly the element around public funding so if the website is publicly funded it's in scope so mm -hmm. if it has public funding it's in scope which i think was news to some people um and i think that also the the fact that in the uk legislation they they have clearly linked it back to the equality act so a failure to deliver web accessibility under this legislation is then considered by GDS to be a breach of the Equality Act really gives that law some teeth because if people weren't aware the Equality Act if you the breach of the Equality Act those fines are uncapped so suddenly it sort of brings stuff into quite clear focus and and what the Equality Act didn't have 
was any clarity over guidelines and how you should comply or anything else. So this is actually quite a significant piece of legislation because it's really putting into place clear guidance upon, at least for some part of disability and inclusion, for some part of accessibility, what it is required for you to do in order to not exclude people and, and, and to comply. So I, I think this is this is a you know a significant moment in in web accessibility in the UK and across Europe. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, I guess relating it back to the community of access chat and accessibility professionals, you know what what that means is there's lots of organisations running around scratching their heads, thinking that we didn't fully understand this. You know, there's lots more clarity legislation of what's expected, what you need to do. Um, so you can imagine, you know, lots more uh, people looking out for, you know, accessibility experts and agencies and groups that they need to work with to make sure that their their digital services are up to scratch. So, you know, again, it's really useful just just to make sure that everyone's really clear on sort of what's what's changing. And, and I think it's useful that this is on the um, the supply side. So, you know, government um, monitoring and encouraging. And uh, I'll, I'll certainly set, share some sort of links in, in, in the uh, Twitter chat of some great guidance and resources that are there to help organisations to, to make sure they're getting more accessible. But I think the other thing I've been looking at too is, is really about the demand side and how can customers say when things are sort of broken. Um, you know, we look at our friends, De Deborah in the US and, uh, you know, lots more being consumer led, saying when things aren't broken, but we don't really have that here in the UK. And, um, you know, again, with my sort of government hat on, I've uh, been doing some work looking at how, um, how how do customers complain? You know, we know this stat that gets trotted out, um, I think, for every 10 disabled users encountering a barrier online, only one of the 10 will bother complaining. The other nine will just give up and walk away because it's too too difficult, too frustrating. They don't think they're getting heard. And I think what this um, this new legislation does is it makes it really clear and simple with kind of a clear disability help pages and who to contact. Um, and one of the things I've done working with all, all the major disability charities is create some better guidance to help individuals. So say if you are having an issue with um, visually impaired Paul can't get my uh, my bin collected and I go to the council site and it doesn't doesn't work for me, then I can, you know, contact them and say what's broken and, you know, ask them to sort of fix it. If I'm not getting anywhere, then, you know, I can sort of escalate to them, to their chief exec as they're formal complaints. I mean, if it's still not working, there's kind of a clear ombudsman uh, in the UK, we call it the um, uh, Equality Advisory Support Service, which is kind of part of the um, people who kind of run the Equality Acts of the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission. But it's just sort of really important to know that there is those kind of steps of, you know, work through with the organisation, more formally complain to the organisation, and if it's not working, take it up with the right government ombudsman. So, you know, really keen to kind of spread the word on how that, that works and make it as easy as possible for people encountering sort of barriers to make sure that they're contacting and complaining to the right places to make positive change. Excellent. Uh, and you know, that whole clarity is really important because I think lots of smaller publicly funded organizations are, are definitely going to be approaching this afresh, uh, maybe for the first time. Um, there is a part around disproportionate burden, as, as there always is with new legislation. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about um, what is considered, what the, what the sort of general sort of guidance is around for small organizations that are publicly funded as to you know where where it's appropriate for them to say actually you know it's going to take us a little bit more time to to get stuff in place um yeah. is, is, there, is there guidance on that at the moment yeah but there certainly is you know i'm not a uh, giving legal advice uh, on, on, on this, sure, I understood. Say, but, but, understood. But, but you know, it, what it really sort of gets to is, you know, if you're a, a large public sector organisation and lots of people are using your site and there's no other way they can do a thing, you know, maybe it's renewing a passport, for example, then it's there's an expectation that you really need to make that service, that particular journey on your site accessible. So it is about looking at what the task is that people are coming to your site to do, 
what parts of your sites are more important than others. So if you're a college or university, you know, is it a teacher area or a student area, for example? Um, and really what disproportionate burden's getting at is if I'm a local government um, council, maybe I don't really have any web development people and maybe all of that is outsourced to a digital agency. And if I ask them to make my site accessible, they say it's going to cost, you know, X million pounds and we simply just don't have that funding uh, in, in government um, at the moment. So again, it, it's taking into account all of those, all of those things in terms of this, you know, the size of, of the organization, the importance of the digital service and presence they have and who actually builds it and owns it and controls it. Yeah. So, um, I, th I think that's a, uh, Deborah, did you want to comment? Because I think there are some similarities in, in, in the US. Well, <clears throat> all I would say, and I think Antonio wanted to comment, um, but I'll, I'll just make a real quick yeah. comment in that we, um, in the United States, we call that undue burden. And what's interesting is if you select the undue burden as a government agency, it actually will flag you. So it is reported to our Congress and Senate. So it's a pretty big deal to do an undue burden. And most of our agencies, unless it is a, a, a privacy or security undue burden, they won't do it. But I know that Antonio wanted to make a comment too, but bravo, bravo to you guys for doing this. Uh, Paul, this is uh, uh, the, the third time that we met, like like you have mentioned before. A lot of things have uh, have changed <laughs> in in the world of accessibility, even in in our own in our own personal lives. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's basically you no know, permanent process of change. So, uh, but in reality, what is actually new in Barclays? Uh, what is keeping your accessibility team busy? Yeah, thanks, Antonio. And oh gosh, yeah, there's quite a lot when I think of like the last year or two. Like I say, you know, we're still, you know, trying to do lots externally and, and, and me for that matter. So whether it's with the Business Disability Forum in the UK, uh, whether it's sort of contributing and writing sort of guidance for the W3C, um, you, you know, and supporting UK government, um, just to make sure we spread the word on accessibility. But gosh, when I think about Barclays, you know, huge amount of change happening. I think as we're doing more, more digital things, there's more projects and people coming through that need our help of how do we consider and deliver accessibility? How do we build a, a great experience for a great number of people? You know, it feels like we've just been running to keep still. You know, we've had sort of WACAG 2.1 um, for the techie folks, understand that sort of bigger um, things to kind of check and consider as we're building out and shipping new things. We've had um, specific bank regulations looking at vulnerable customers that we're um, still looking at. So not just uh, the impact of customers that might have disability and mental health conditions, but what about if you're um, financially vulnerable? Um, you know, what about um, financial and emotional resilience? So death, divorce, um, and, and, and so forth. And it's a really interesting area to understand how we need to um, better serve those customers, how our digital services need to maybe adapt to those customers. Um, so you get a sense, you know, that changing our accessibility practices to deal with the huge amount of projects coming through as we're trying to mandate and mainstream accessibility, you know, using powerful accessibility tools. And, you know, I have to sort of tip my hat to um, the likes of sort of DQ and, you know, that Axe um, engine sort of making lives easier. And also in recent months, Microsoft, the Microsoft Accessibility Insights tool, amongst others that, you know, make this really easy when you're a small accessibility team and many organizations, there might just be one person, um, you know, trying to get a whole um, army of digital people to build things in an accessible way, you know, can be quite, quite tough. So again, you know, there's, there's far better and powerful tooling out there. There's a huge amount of, of my team's time looking at training and how do we provide really quality training about accessibility, need to knows and do's. Um, and I guess when I think about products, you know, we, we do a huge amount of disabled user testing to make sure that, you know, our main Barclays websites, the apps for cash machines do truly work for everyone. And maybe to give you an example, when I think about the new features we're building in, like um, uh, being able to take a, a picture of your smartphone of a paper check and have it processed and paid instantly into your bank account, you know, it's convenient for many of us, but it could be transformational for some of us who couldn't get to the to the bank branch. 
So again, you know, we, we go to great pains to do a lot of disabled user testing and consultation when we see some of these new features being launched that we think are actually of arguably sort of more, most benefits to people with sort of particular impairments. You know, same thing with video banking, for example, and making sure, you know, not just, you know, we think it might work if people are reliant on lip, lip reading, but, you know, really, really sort of making sure of that. So, um, yeah, all, all in all, you know, lots about new ways of working, lots about new products, looking at this whole sort of vulnerability and sometimes rather than an on online retailer trying to make things super simple, you think of Amazons and so forth and making it really easy for people to find a product and put it in their cart and pay for it. In the sort of banking world, sometimes we have to sort of add vulnerability back in, um, you know, for certain segments, for example. So, you know, that's been a really interesting um, and creative challenge to look at. And just again, the sort of training and tools. So, yeah, lots going on internally. And when I sort of step back and think about the community, you know, I've mentioned how proud I am of you, you, you folks for the Access Chat community. And even rolling forwards, we've got what Inclusive Design 24 coming up to spread the word, the gospel of accessibility externally. In the UK, we've got TechShare Pro in November. And in December, you know, a huge amount of, of resources, courses that happen to mark International Day for Persons with Disabilities. So it just feels to me like it's, it's a particularly busy time. Thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, and I'm sure uh, Deborah, who has been uh, traveling around the world, will be very keen <laughs> in, in talking about uh, trends. Uh, back to, uh, to you, Deborah. Thank you. And <clears throat> before I do that, I do want to just thank you, Paul and, and Neil, both as heads of major corporations, major global corporations, because I see y'all contributing everywhere. I see. And I don't always see that across the board. I see you, you know, you're engaged in the Valuable 500, you're engaged in supporting the IAAP, you're engaged in, you know, Purple Light Up. It's just you're everywhere. You're supporting W3C, you're engaged in so many ways and the leadership value that you're both bringing is invaluable. And I think that we don't thank you enough. So I definitely want to thank um, both of you and everybody that's doing the work. <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> and um, but my question is, what accessibility trends do you see more broadly? Sure. I mean, I think I, I've sort of mentioned, you know, a sort of powerful tool. So sometimes it's it's getting easier to embed accessibility. I mean, stepping back though, right, you know, we've seen more laws come in in recent months. So whether it's Canada, whether it's in UK and Europe, as, as we've talked about, so there's more kind of what's um, demanded by law. We're seeing more lawsuits as well, right? You know, so whether it's for US and, and Domino's Pizza or, or wherever else. And that's great that, you know, what's required legally is, is, is really clearing up, you know. And, and of course, we've got user expectations as people fiddle around with their smartphones and, and make the most of how to make stuff bigger and easier to, you know, hear and, and, and understand and use. Again, people's expectations are up now in what they use on their devices and then what they come in and expect in their workplaces, um, you know, which is really interesting too, to kind of keep on top of that. And it's no surprise with all of this that the interest, the, the organizations about, oh gosh, we, we've heard this thing about accessibility, but what do we really need to do? You know, I spend a lot of my time talking to organizations who are kind of waking up to that all oh, this is getting quite important and are now figuring, you know, the sort of second step of, of where do I start? Um, I mean, I know, I know we've just um, created a, a new benchmarking tool, a maturity model with um, our friends at the Business Disability Forum that, that Neil and I are a part of, which again, really helps answer that question. But in answer to the trends, Deborah, I think one of the biggest areas that's holding us back is probably language. And, you know, when I reflect on this, I sort of think in recent weeks, you know, we've had what, 50 years since, you know, putting a, um, you know, man on the moon. And I sort of think, you know, well, that was the space race, but if we called it a space agenda, would we have still got there? And I think about, you know, the disability agenda, the accessibility agenda, that, you know, there's, there's not really the same urgency as I see and feel when I speak to customers daily who can't do certain things. So, you know, there's something about the language we use to give a sense of urgency and importance. And I think people 
you know, here, here diversity and inclusion and, and many of our HR diversity inclusion colleagues use some of these words and, and, and sometimes it's not always fully understood by the, the rest of the organisation and people they speak to. So just to give you an, uh, uh, an idea of this, you know, we're, we're now starting to talk about inclusive design in a slightly different way. And, and it, just to kind of un unpack it, it goes like this, that, you know, if, if I was in a room and I asked, um, you know, 100 people there, what does exclusion mean? Everyone kind of knows that, you know, it's being left out or left behind. But if I asked 100 people what in inclusion means, I get almost 100 different answers. You know, maybe it's about, you know, merit-based uh, hiring without bias, or, or maybe it's about doing something for everyone or, or, or whatever. So it, it kind of confuses matters. And when people talk about inclusion, sometimes you must get that kind of glazing over, just not quite getting it to then get past the next step of what they really need to do. And, um, you know, we've been thinking about this for some time. The way we now approach this, and again, I've spoken to a number of accessibility and inclusive design folks, is we really need a really basic way of how everyone can understand this. Because it's not just talking about, you know, diverse and inclusive workforces, you know, about creative, productive colleagues and, and, and so forth, but actually for the entire organization. And we need to put it in a business speak. So for us, you know, I, I go back to this numpty example. I think about, you know, imagine you had all, all your users, a population out there, and, you know, a, quite a lot of them are bunched to the centre, you know, the average or normal, whatever we want to call it, based on whatever characteristics we're looking at, you know, it could be disability or age. And if I'm a product designer trying to build something, the way I think about this is I've got like a lasso of inclusion. And what we've always historically done is, you know, this kind of one size fits all approach. We've said, let's say I'm trying to build something like a lift and I'm figuring out where to put the button. You know, I might look at, well, people are so short and they're so tall. So if I put the lift button around this height, it should work for most. And I sort of think about, well, I'm throwing a sort of lasso of inclusion over the sort of people bunched in the center and those people, my product that I'm building, it works for them, right? But the flip side of that is I'm clearly excluding people. And often many organizations just stop there. So they've considered people's needs, but that's it. And in my mind, the sort of inclusive design is, is actually making an effort to consult with real world people, sort of one at a time, going around the edges, the fringes, and saying, okay, well, what would I need to do to make this work for you? So maybe there's a super tall person that may need you know, a, a second button higher up so I can, I can tweak that to my product and it, it works for them and works for everyone else. Or maybe there's a wheelchair user and I need to put some um, crazy proximity sensors and beacons because you know, they don't have the reach, for example, to press the button. So you start to see I'm going around one by one and my lasso of inclusion starts getting jagged edges because the world is messy and people are different. But it's an important point of going from sort of considering, you know, the what works for most people to sort of consulting with and asking more for that sort of inclusion and and to break that down, you know, why is what does this matter? Well, you know, clearly there's people previously excluded can now use and enjoy your, your product or participate in society. So it's changed them. But it's kind of also changed the person throwing the lasso of inclusion, right? You know, when you do this, you can't unsee exclusion, you know, whether it's you know, using the, uh, you know, toilets with sensors that aren't great if you're visually impaired to figure out the flush. You know, maybe it's using the, the sensors at the bathroom sink that turn on, but, you know, maybe that your skin colour, they don't work for you because it hasn't been, you know, designed. You know, you can see exclusion everywhere. Or maybe, you know, it's the spinny doors and corporate offices that work for right-handed people to help them. But if you're left-handed, they kind of hinder you. You know, you don't really stop and sort of think about these things unless it typically impacts you. So, you know, I think thinking about inclusive design like this, impacting people previously excluded but can now use your thing, changing yourself. And I guess the third and most important point is it sort of changes society. Everyone else using the product because they see these invisible or previously invisible people using your product. So it's kind of a simple idea, but it's really powerful because it goes back to, you know, we are changed from what we have seen and when we are seen. We say it again, you know, we are changed from what we have seen and when we are seen. So, you know, this idea of really making sure that, you know, when we talk about accessible design, inclusive design, universal design, whatever, but if the, the idea is about, you know, step one, consider diverse needs of, of everyone, you know, step two, consult with rural people, and step three, even better still, hire 
diverse disabled talent who will be far better at throwing that lasso of inclusion so you have more and more happier customers you know it's kind of a no-brainer right so i think you know some of these concepts of inclusive design you know really important to kind of spread great answer i know that neil wanted to make a comment neil let me turn it over to you oh thank you uh, and uh, paul I'm, I'm with you when you actually design something that works for the edge you're actually much more likely to capture the middle anyway so mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm interested um, because I know this is a shared interest um, in skills you talked about you're going out and you're visiting lots of organizations and yes we're equipping them with tools but there's also a need uh, for those organizations to hire people that can help them in their their journey to being more accessible and we know from our own experience that that's quite actually quite hard to do so you know we're seeing new 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 graduates coming into teams you know that they've been trained in how to create applications but they've not been trained about accessibility so um I, i'm participating and, and i know you are too in a number of efforts to to try and bring those those skills into the mainstream but can you talk a little bit more about how you see this this need and, and, and what you think we can do to improve things here yeah sure and and I think you know it's it's no surprise like that many, many sort of large disability confident organizations we're all sort of building our own um, library or sort of you know training hub of accessibility content and delivering it in sort of you know often sort of, um, engaging in memorable ways that people really get a sense of empathy and compassion, right? That our customers come in different shapes and sizes and that they need to be consciously conscious uh, of, of what they're building. So I think many organizations start with this sort of accessibility 101, the sort of basics. You know, WACAG, for example, is great about talking what, what you need to do and how to do it, but not really so good about why you need to do it and who it's for. So sort of injecting that sort of human aspect having a sort of basic grounding is, is important. And then having sort of role-based pathways of what designers and developers and testers need to know and, and do. So we can kind of build that up, but it's really important to think about the best way that we deliver it, the best way that we build champions and communities to support one another. But it, I think what your point is really getting at is that if we as um, organizations all do the same thing. We're not really solving the problem. You know, someone from Barclays, it becomes great accessibility and then they leave and we get someone new in and we have to sort of teach them. So really getting to the heart of the matter, it's looking at actually university programs, colleges, and when they're teaching um, computer, um, you know, computer sciences, design, how can we make sure that accessibility, inclusive design is, is a kind of a topic, it's a chapter, in their textbook, so to speak, and how do we, as, as businesses and organisations, help support the um, you know educational institutions to bring it to life, um, you know, in in a practical way? So I know you know we are involved in many of those conversations. I know there's global efforts like Teach Access um, in the US too, but really looking at how can organisations, businesses, really help support. Um, you know how people educate um, you know the, the sort of digital students uh, the accessibility experts of tomorrow so yeah there's still quite a lot of work to do on that front yeah yeah I, I think I think you're right I mean we're we're making some progress so we um, if people are interested there is a consultation going on right now around our proposal for an accessibility digital accessibility apprenticeship standard in the UK um, so please people go to the uh, Institute for Apprenticeships website take a look give us your comments give us your feedback I know that we're also working with the Institute of Coding and we, Paul you and I are both going to be there on, on Monday where we've got a number of universities and a number of stakeholders looking how we can inject accessibility into the pedagogy uh, yeah you mentioned teach access and I think that that's that's also really useful but we've, we've got sort of a duality of needs here we've got the need for um, general awareness in our uh, in our new generation of technologists that are coming through and then we've got the the need for specialism as well because I think if we go back to where we started which was 
all of these websites need to be accessible. There's an increased uh, monitoring of this stuff. Uh, yeah, we can see that the the demand coming down down the track, and um, we, we need ways of of meeting that demand for being able to assess and fix the issues that we we find when we do assess. So I think it's uh, a mixture of things. It's people skills, uh, specialist people, uh, you know, no, sort of people with skills that are generalists, you know, technology generalists. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the specialists. And then, yes, the automation tools. Uh, and I, if we're to go on to um, you know, the next stage and look at uh, new technologies, it's like, how can we maybe utilize AI and, and machine learning more effectively to move from maybe the 20% that we're going uh, through now in automated testing to make that 30, 40, 50% so that we are removing some of the burden that we face in terms of manual testing because at the moment you can run automated tools and they are getting better but there's there's still an awful lot that requires human intervention to get it, to get it right and then I'm going to you know hand over to Deborah and Antonio I know they've both got questions but where do you see this going okay yeah I mean I think you, you, <laughs> you're right, um, you know, the skills and sort of knowledge you need to be an accessibility guru uh, or Jedi, you know, are, are quite varied, you know, there's technical skills, there's business skills, there's people skills, and I think it goes back to giving people a grounding in the basics and then having, um, you know, the opportunity to kind of branch off based on your kind of skills and interests. The so building those pathways are really important building the content what we need to know and then the best way to deliver that and engage people um, is really important and I think the apprentice um, programs too that you touched on Neil you know it's really important um, again thinking about how people can kind of transition and get in you know into this industry right from a sort of school um, school place to the workplace it still goes back right I'm sure I've said this before but as accessibility experts we spend our time removing barriers for disabled people yet sometimes we construct barriers in how other people get trained in this topic and we really need to, to kind of get over that and figure out a better way to do it so I know you know we're always conscious about how can we open source any any useful resources and videos that we have internally you know if, if it's not massively specific to to Barclays, it hasn't been Barclays are fired, then again we can kind of share that externally, right? And you know, I'd encourage other organizations to sort of look at, at what they can do to contribute back to. Thank you. Uh, uh, my, uh, myself and, and a group of uh, colleagues, and we, or, we organize uh, an hackathon in Dublin in, in the last couple of years, and we often get young developers from different universities in Ireland joining the event, helping to run the event, helping being part of the teams who are trying to build solutions. And we often get uh, this, type of, uh, this type of comments. Oh, I didn't know about this. Uh, I, this is quite interesting. I must learn more about how can I develop an accessible app how can I improve my code? You know, where do you guys, where can I go to learn more about this? Because nobody has mentioned this before. And I, I believe that I need to learn a bit more about and develop my skills to be able to, to do uh, apps that people can actually use. So people get really excited about something that they feel that they need to do. Uh, e even uh, if they never came uh, across that during their their years in university. So I, I think that the part of training is particularly relevant, especially f for young developers, because I think from the moment that you put that in front of people, they will just adopt, consume, and self-develop. Yeah, and, and just real quick on that, that point, Antonio, you know, it's important that we, um, you know, we train up young, young eager beaver sort of developers on accessibility who haven't thought of it. But we also have to kind of um, better train and equip, you know, existing developers, right? You know, we're almost playing catch up here in accessibility land um, on this who, who haven't kind of thought about this before. And certainly for a large organization, right, we struggle with um, our developers often are so, so far removed from our customers. So I had, I had this experience for, our, our, you know, two minutes, I'll, I'll kind of tell you this story. And um, how it goes is that, 
um, you know, we, we got a complaint a few weeks back from a, a, a customer, you know, it was a, a retired doctor, retired GP, and he was struggling, you know, coming to terms with sight loss. He'd lost most of his sight very suddenly, you know, coming to terms with being dependent on other people, family members to manage his finances. And, you know, coming to terms with trying to figure out all this, how to use tech, how to use assistive tech, you know, just overwhelmed, overwhelmed. So, you know, I went out, spent some time with him, showing him how he could, you know, use a tablet still, how we could email friends, how we could um, video call, should we say, his um, uh, grandchildren and how he could kind of use our Barclays app, you know, zooming up and speaking aloud to still manage his money, to see his balance, to make payments. Um, and, you know, it was really moving, you know, and at the end of it, he um, he got up and hugged me and he said, I'm so proud of Barclays of the accessibility efforts. I had no idea this existed. You know, the work we've done today, you know, it's urgent, it's important, it really matters. You know, please tell the teams who build this, it matters. And a lot of my time is really just spent doing that, conveying that back to some of our developers, um, offshore teams that don't quite feel and face that, um, you know, that feedback, the wow moments when we get it right and the pain points when we don't, um, you know, so really, <laughs> really important how we can kind of close that digital divide of people building stuff and people using stuff. Great point, Paul. Deborah, did you have a, a point before we close? I have a point and it, 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 I have a question and it's a hard question. Great. So I'll just tell Go you that on. right away. Go on. And, and, and this question is for Paul and, uh, well, it's for all three of you, but the, these are the, um, it, it's so wonderful to be global and to hear what's happening all over the world. It, it's very helpful for me as I bring it back to the country that I love being part of the American, you know, the United States. But the complaints that I keep hearing from our corporations, and I understand that we are confusing our corporations by all the litigation, but at the same time, if you would make your things accessible, we'd stop suing you. But, um, but this is what I'm hearing from the U.S. corporations, that it's very, very hard to make a very large global corporation accessible, and that the accessibility experts in the United States don't really understand the complexity of what these large global companies have to get their hands around. And so they... I hear often that they're doing everything the accessibility community in the United States is telling them to do, and yet they're still getting sued. So I was just wondering, Paul and Neil, especially in the two roles that you play, if you wouldn't mind giving some of our U.S. corporations just a little advice. I, I know that we're doing other good things, like um, Neil mentioned in the window, um, our chat window, to remind us remind the audience of the efforts that are being made with the IAAP certifications on procurement and leadership. All those things help. But what do you say to the corporations and your both? Both of your um, firms are in the court in the United States of how to truly get your hands around it because it just seems like there's more progress being made in your side of the pond than ours. So I was just wondering if y'all you know, would care to address that. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean. I, th I think for accessibility, motives matter. And I know internally, you know, we survey thousands of our colleagues annually across the world and we ask them, you know, what, what, why do you bother with accessibility? And for me, it's really encouraging to see that this kind of, because legally in compliance you have to, has now been overtaken by, well, actually commercially, it's kind of, it makes good business sense. You know, we have more, happier customers. So I think that kind of business benefit trumping the legal compliance risk. I do appreciate, Deborah, that, you know, many um, US corporates, for example, they're coming to this journey because they've kind of, um, you know, what's the word, been, um, uh, you know, Beaten, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I wasn't quite, I wasn't quite <laughs> sure how to say it politely, but you know, sort of surprise. You know, your 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 service, what you're selling, you know, just doesn't work for me and you know, and and, and a certain segment like me. So I think it's a wake up call, and because of that, they're quite you know reluctant of I'm having to do this because 
because of the kind of legal drive and I don't really see why and I need to sort of pay some experts that may or may not end up to be experts and give me the advice or tweak my site mm -hmm. for what it needs to be. So I, I think, you know, because of that, people can do all the things that they've been told to do and it still doesn't quite work. But what's driving them is often the sort of, you know, the wrong motives to start with. And I think the more organizations can actually get out there, and we were saying just before we started about, um, you know, there seems to be a very small number of organizations of inclusive brands that have got great stories to tell about, you know, we did a, um, you know, hiring program here for certain uh, impairment groups, for example, or maybe, you know, we did some new product or, um, you know, Tommy Hilfiger, for example, or, Microsoft's Xbox controller, you know, they are great stories in themselves, but let's let, you know, they are still pockets of progress, right? And I guess for more organizations can do more in this space and actually demonstrate the kind of, you know, we, we often talk about the return on investment, you know, but bluntly it's demonstrating the benefits that this brings by doing a bit more around accessibility, you know, adds huge amounts of value. I mean, we see it as Barclays as a brand, um, but it's kind of how you tell that story to others that's, uh, that's really important. Um, and, and I know, you know, Neil, you're involved in lots of stuff around um, organizations. How do they measure it? All these kind of um, environmental, social governance, ESG type stuff. And there's various indices about um, whether we're looking at disability indexes and DNI in general. But I think there's, you know, going to be a bit more focus. We've got some of the the gender reporting happening, and I suspect over the coming few years, we'll have more reporting across other uh, diverse inclusion dimensions. So there will be a more focus, and hopefully people able to measure and show the value of, of accessibility. Um, and, and let's not forget, right, Deborah, you know, there's some great benchmarking tools. So organizations that um, want to do this are being told that they have to do this, of where to start, like the um, accessibility maturity model, you know, great, free resource uh, out there. Uh, Neil, anything to add? Yeah, so um, I, I kind of think sometimes, you know, doing accessibility in a large corporation is a bit like um, pushing water uphill. You know, it's quite difficult unless you have a wheelbarrow and you can fill it with water and, you know, get most of it up the hill. So um, I think every good accessibility person in corporate should have a wheelbarrow. Um, but in all seriousness, I think that, that there's an element of persistence here. You know, you, these things take time. You know, they're big organizations, and, and, and as a result, that change is going to be slow, but it's inexorable. Because once you've, once you've started, it, do, it doesn't go backwards. So I, I think the thing to remember is that actually these changes are tangible. We've seen the change in your organization. We're changing ours. And that makes a real difference um, and we can evidence that, we can use the benchmarking tools, et cetera. So it's really to sort of not lose heart um, because you will eventually bring people around. And we've seen this within our own organization too. So we had people that were res responsible for our internal communications tools and, and there was resistance. And now they're the best example we have of inclusive design and accessible uh, agile processes that we have in our organization. So that people can change. So um, now we're, we're pretty much at the end of our time. Thank you very much again for a great interview. You know, it's it's really um, great that you're continuing to support us. We really appreciate all of the, the work that Barclays does and the support that you give to Access Chat and the wider community. Thank you also to our other supporters, uh, Microlink and, and MyClearText for providing such wonderfully clear captions. Um, we can't wait to have you on Twitter on Tuesday. Thank you very much, Paul. Cool. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul.